Let's go ahead and get started. We're going through a topic. Now, if you're near, new here today, this may seem a little bit weird, but we've been going through a series called Trojan Horse, or more specifically, Trojan Horses in the Church, things that are creeping into today's church. Uh, I would consider our church as a somewhat traditional, conservative, fundamental church. I am not saying that we're really old-fashioned. We try to be modernized, but we try to stay true to the scriptures and to be a church that is a loving church and a caring church and just a church that we want to be exactly like what the Bible says. We really want to fulfill what the Bible tells us to be as a church. And I hope you notice that, that we are a little bit different. Now, my wife tells me I'm different all the time, but besides that. Okay, so we're going to talk about the New Age today. We've been going through this series. We're going to finish it next week, and then we're going to get into the Christmas season. And then we'll start our new series in January on the 15th. We're going to start in the book of Revelation. So we'll go through the book of Revelation verse by verse and try to explain this and simplify it the best we can because I believe the day we're living in today is a scary day, isn't it? And so I think we're getting closer and closer, and it's good for Christians to know this stuff. The book of Revelation is not all about gloom and doom. It talks about the unveiling of Jesus Christ, so it's an excellent, wonderful book. But as we continue through this here series, The Trojan Horse, we're on our uh, ninth topic today. We're going to talk about the New Age, and the New Age is creeping into the church. Now, we'll explain what the New Age is here just shortly, but... This may surprise you on some of the things I'm going to talk about. Now, so far what we talked about, I would say the New Age topic is the most subtle or most non-detectable. Most people don't have a clue. They go to church, they don't really understand or realize that a lot of these things is the New Age creeping into the church. Now, of all the tops we covered, I'd say the one that was the most persuasive, when we talked about Calvinism a few weeks ago, we talked about the tulip, the five points of Calvinism. That's got its tentacles in many, many churches. And so that's the one I'd say is most persuasive. But then the one that's most predominant is this idea of turning from your sins to be saved. Repentance, I do believe, means to change your mind. And that's literally what the word means, uh, metanoia. And I've got two messages on that in our YouTube channel. Just go to Bible BibleChurch and listen to it if you don't understand that. Because I believe that you can't add anything to salvation. Salvation is a free gift. You can't add anything before it or anything after it. It's by faith in Jesus Christ and that alone. He died on the cross for you and your sins and offers that to you freely. And I really want to make sure that I emphasize that and keep that as clear and as simple as possible. Because today things are pretty convoluted and people are confused. And they don't ever hear that. And I think we want to be a church that teaches the gospel each and every week. So we covered these eight topics so far. This is our ninth topic. This is going to be somewhat of an eye-opening topic for us. And it, is, it was for me as the more and more I studied this, the more I learned about it. Um, that pamphlet you have about Jesus Calling is going to be part of our study today. So if today's message gets you a little bit rattled, if you think, well, he's gone too far now. He's gone off the deep end. I mean, why is he talking about this stuff? It's getting a little too nitpicky on all this. Well, remember Eve, when she was in the garden, and Satan came to her, and he wasn't a serpent at the time, okay? I don't know what he exactly looked like, but they had the dialogue. And she, he got her to have some doubt. And it was, it was pretty subtle, and everything looked like it was sweet and kind, and he, she asked questions, he asked questions, and they answered them. And pretty soon, according to Genesis chapter 3, Eve started having doubt, and then she looked at that fruit on the tree and she said, it was good to eat. It was beautiful. It'll make me wise. I'll understand the difference between sin and not sin, and so on and so on. So she took an aid of it, and Adam ate of it. And you know what? That's why we're in this problem we are today, aren't we? <laughs> it's all their fault. We, if we were there, we would have never did that, right? I don't think so. <laughs> we're all sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you know what? Satan is a master deceiver, and he brings things in so subtle. And I believe this idea of the new age was brought in very subtle. So we're going to talk about four topics today because we're going to see that the new age has a plan, and Satan has a plan to deceive this world. So this is just one of the topics that we've covered throughout this series. The first one we're going to talk about a book. Now, there's many books that talk about this New Age theology. And the main one we're going to talk about today is the one called Jesus Calling, which is in your bulletin, so you can learn and understand about that. We're going to talk about contemplative prayer. Now you can say, what's wrong with prayer? Well, this is a little bit different. We'll see that as we go through this. Then we're going to talk about an exercise. The New Age actually has an exercise. You know that? We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about a theology that the New Age has, and that's called Word of Faith, and we'll see that. So I'm not here to try to get anybody shook up or to rattle in anybody's feathers, but the New Age is a blending of 
all these religions and philosophies as one. It's unity. Um, let's all get together, love, peace, harmony. Kind of sounds like politics, doesn't it, today? <laughs> so they all fit together. So believe me, they do. All, we're all going, this, this world is going in one direction, and that is in unity. You know, just to be under one world government, on one world leader called the Antichrist. And yet, I believe we'll be gone. Because the rapture occurs, I believe, before the tribulation. And Jesus will take us home. And that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? So, I believe this here topic is more about being self-centered, man-centered. The New Age is all about me, 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 and what I am. And in 2 Timothy 3, 2, as we'll look at a little later, it means they're lovers of their self. We're lovers of ourselves, and that's the way it is today. Everybody just loves their own self. Put me first. So here, my objective, as I said already, is not to ruffle your feathers. But if it does ruffle your feathers and you lay an egg, sometimes things like this happen, and you need to have that. What kind of church would we be if we never said anything that pricked us a little bit or convicted us, right? We need some of this stuff sometimes. So if it ruffles your feathers, um, that's just the way it is, okay? We all need our feathers ruffled once in a while, don't we? Okay. <laughs> So, now we got the chicken out of the way. Let's go ahead and start our message. And so let's learn what is the new age. Okay, what is it? Well, it's really not new. The new age has been around probably mainly for like the last 50 years, but mainly back in 100 years ago it kind of started, but truly it goes back to the Garden of Eden in a sense. So, but in this country we see this new age kind of philosophy creeping into the church over the last 50 to 100 years. And so it is... This New Age thinking has its roots in Eastern mysticism. Now, I'll talk about mysticism here a little while when we get into slide six. But it means a spiritual encounter with God. And basically, you're, you're getting additional information besides the Bible in this New Age. And they're trying to communicate to you something new to get you into this whole philosophy. Now, I believe that goes against Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19, where it says, don't add to God's word or take away from God's word. God's word it is, is what it is. This is God's word, and it says what it wants us to know. I don't think we should add to it or take away from it. I'd be very careful about saying, God, I'm going to add to your word. I'm going to take away from your word. So that is what we won't want to do, but I believe this here, New Age, does that. It attempts to bypass your mind, as it says on the screen. In other words, open up your mind. The Bible is not enough. You need to receive more information. The Bible is not sufficient, and that's the idea of the New Age. They talk about this um, new organ of perception, the third eye, which gives spiritual light, and so one needs to get to their psychic self. And a lot of this has to do with pride, to think that, hey, I'm up here because I've achieved this enlightenment, you know. And so that's what Satan always does. Now, who's the most prideful person you know? Well, Satan is, right? And he tries to appeal to our pride. So we'll see that as we go through this here. But by training oneself to ignore messages from the mind or to see the mind that is actually achieving cosmic consciousness, the mind can create reality. So we'll, we'll explain this here as we go through this, what the age really, New Age really does. So here, the next thing here, the New Age movement is a counterfeit philosophy. It's a deception. You can be anything you want to be, and that's the idea of the New Age. It goes right along with this idea of positive thinking and some of these gurus, gurus that teach these things and write these books and have these seminars. You think it, you can have it. And that's basically what the New Age is saying. And it kind of creeps into the church, and a lot of churches believe this stuff too. So, it's the idea that it appeals to your feelings, wants to make you feel good. Now, there's any, is there anything wrong with feeling good? No, of course not. But hey, what the world teaches to make you feel good is temporary and it won't last. The Bible says we should have joy, and joy is forever. You know, we're going to suffer. The Bible says if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you'll suffer persecution. Now, how many of us like to suffer persecution? We don't. We try to avoid it. But the Bible says we will, and you should be excited when you suffer persecution for Christ because that means you're doing what he wants you to do. So here's the thing. Leading them to think that they are a God, this whole idea teaches that you have a little God within yourself and that you can enhance your life through your own person. So the new age has a goal, and it's called the age of Aquarius. Remember the age of Aquarius, that song, um, uh, Let the Sun Shine In? That song was written in all 1969, back in the hippie generation, when I was just a young little kid. And people were going around singing this song, and it, that song fits in perfectly with today's age. And there's another song that fits in today, too, and it's called the song Imagine by John Lennon. Go home today and listen, take these songs and find the lyrics for the song Aquarius and the song um, Imagine and read the words. Look at the lyrics. You'll say, wow, that sounds like what we're doing today. 
fits right in. But that started out back in the 60s and the 70s, and it was to get people ready for this. Did you know that they just recently voted on, I don't know what group did this, but they voted on the ranking of these songs, and this song, The Age of Aquarius, you know what ranking it was? In the top 100, number 66. <laughs> Isn't that interesting <laughs> when you think about it? But I thought, when I saw that, I said, well, go figure. So this song here, Imagine, you know, John Lennon sang it. He said, imagine there's no heaven, um, imagine there's no hell, above us only sky. And he goes on, I'm not, I'm not a dreamer, I'm not the only one. It's interesting that this is the same thing that is being taught today in the world today. And that's what Satan wants us to believe, that you're a God, you can do what you want, there's no heaven, there's no Jesus. It's all not true. You've all seen the bumper stickers that say coexist, right? And they say coexist and all religions are the same. They'll all get you to this so-called, what you call heaven. And it's peace, unity, love, and joy. But it's just not the truth. This age of Aquarius is really the thing we call today the new world order. It's Satan's, it's Satan's um, he wants to come in and possess an antichrist and take over this world and be the leader of this world. And people are being subtly programmed to fit in with this. Sometimes this is called progressive Christianity, by the way, and that's a liberal Christianity, which um, today a lot of Christianity is becoming more and more liberal. Before it used to just be the ones to the far left that didn't believe the Bible, but now people are afraid to really teach the Bible for what it says verse by verse anymore. So that is what's kind of sad and scary about this. Okay, so let's look at some comparisons here real quick, just to get us going. We're going to talk about the modern Jesus, which I will call the New Age Jesus, the Biblical Jesus, and what the Word of God says. So I have some verses here, but I won't read all these verses as we go through this. But the first one is, the New Age Jesus preaches only on love. Now, Jesus is love, right? But that's not the only thing about Jesus. I mean, we don't have love at the expense of biblical teaching or at the expense of sin, right? But the Biblical Jesus... He is love, and he went to the cross to die for you and to display his love, but he preaches righteousness. In fact, Matthew 5, 6 says this, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. And God wants us to want righteousness. Now, love comes along with that. But love comes along with first having a good foundation of biblical truth. You don't have love at the expense of everything else, but the Modern Jesus only speaks about love, okay? Then the next thing gives you health and wealth. You've all heard that before, right? You listen to uh, TV evangelists. Uh, they believe in their mind, their thoughts, that if you have enough faith, you will be rich, you won't be poor. But Jesus gives us salvation, hope, peace, and joy. And that's for eternity. That's not just temporary. Romans 15, 13 says, Now the God of hope, Fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. So this hope we have of a future is because of Jesus Christ and we'll have an eternity spending with him in heaven. I mean, there's nothing more encouraging than that. The temporary stuff in this world will not last. I mean, people want health and wealth and there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, we go through some bad times. We, we go through some depressing times and sad times, don't we? We go through some hard things. God doesn't put us on this earth that we're always going to be healthy, we're always going to be wealthy like some of these guys teach. I mean, my wife and I had a rough weekend this week. We took her little dog, which she, inherited, she got from her mother when her mother passed away years ago, and the little dog had something in his throat, and it, we didn't know what it was, so we took it into the vet. And yesterday, by the way, was my wife's birthday, so she didn't have a very nice birthday, but her dog died on the, on the, with the, at the vet's, had a heart failure, and they couldn't revive it. So she's been sad all day. Well, tell me, do you all go through sad times like this too? When we lose people or lose somebody or something happens, we all have problems. We all have financial problems. We all have health problems. We all have relationship problems. We all go through these things. But don't let that discourage you or depress you. You always have to look at Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for us. What could be better than that? Be excited. Be energetic because it's true. Yeah, we go down, we get discouraged sometimes, but boy, we can have such a bright outlook because we know how this book ends, don't we? And you know, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're there, right there with Jesus Christ. So, that's the second one. The third one is, um, the modern Jesus never says anything negative. Um, they dream, they say world peace, they say all be love. They don't say anything negative because if they say things negative, that's a negative force and they don't want to have any negative force. Everything's got to be positive. 
Okay, but what does Jesus do? Jesus warns of sin, judgment, and hell. He warns of it because hell is real. Sin is real. And if you don't know Christ as Savior, you're not going to go to heaven. You're going to go to hell. And that's the scary thing about all this. In Matthew 23, verse 33, Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day, You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Now, if Jesus was starting a church, he wouldn't, he'd have people leaving his church, wouldn't he? By saying stuff like that, right? But you've got to preach God's word. You've got to teach God's word. You've got to stand strong. And so Jesus warned of this stuff coming, and people should listen to him because it is true. So the next one here is this uh, new age or modern Jesus wants to be loved and accepted by the world. Oh, he's the Jesus that everybody loves and everything's okay. But is that the true Jesus of the Bible? No. The true Jesus of the Bible was hated and despised by the world, right? What did they do to Jesus? They nailed him to a cross. They killed him. They crucified him. And so Mark 14, verse 36 says, and he said, am I in the right one here? No, Luke 21, 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So Jesus Christ, even though he is despised and rejected of men, he's coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we look forward to that day. So the next one here is, they believe this modern Jesus or this new age Jesus serves your will and not God's will. If you want it, you just think it. God's here to be kind of like a genie, you know, that, hey, if you want something, he'll give it to you. And the sad thing is a lot of people believe this, and the only ones that truly get rich are the ones that are preaching this stuff and not the ones that are in the pulpit or watching TV and sending their money in. And that's what's truly sad about this. It's like it's all about yourself, but the true biblical Jesus exalts God and goes to what the Father's will wants, and we should be the th same thing. We should want God's will. So, Mark 14, 36 says this. This is Jesus before he was going to the cross. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Jesus Christ did his Father's will and went to the cross for you and I. Aren't you thankful he did that? I mean, he provides us salvation, and he did God's will. And you, you think that you and I doing God's will, we're going to be blessed if we do things that are more what God wants and not what we ourselves want for our own selves, you will be blessed. Follow God's will always. So the last one here is hates to offend you or others. So here's the thing. You'll find most churches aren't going to say anything that's going to offend anybody because if they do, then people will never come back. But you know what? We sometimes need to have God's word taught to us for what it says. And sometimes it may offend us. I mean, Jesus Christ offended the world with his truth. They were offended by him. That's why then they were offended by all the disciples, right? All the disciples except one died a martyr's death. And hey, if you're serving Christ, you may have problems in your life. And you may get persecuted. John the Baptist did everything right. And he was beheaded. Did you know that? He did everything right and he was beheaded. So I'm not saying we're going to be beheaded, but hey, during that tribulation time period, if you don't know Christ as Savior, things like that are going to happen in this world again. So if you don't know Christ, trust Him right now as your personal Savior. So the whole idea is the modern Jesus or the new age Jesus, it's about glorifying yourself. It's all about the now. It's all about everything that you can get right now. They have what's called this law of attraction. If you think it enough in your mind, you'll be attracted to it or it'll be attracted to you. And we've all seen books on shelves in bookstores that talk about this stuff, stuff by these um, New Age teachers. Okay, so the last verse I'll read here is Matthew 26, 31. Jesus, as he was on the Mount of Olives, going to the Garden of Gethsemane, he said this to his disciples, All you shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. He was quoting from Zechariah 13, 7. He said the sheep will be scattered. Because they were all offended because of Christ when he went to the cross. So let's go ahead and move on. Does the Bible truly warn us about this new age? I mean, what do you think? Does it warn us? Well, we'll see that next, okay? We'll look at a couple of verses here. Now, I know this is a little bit different than typical messages, but we're trying to go through this idea of, uh, in the church today, these Trojan horses. So we'll be done with this next week when we learn about discernment, and we'll be able to learn... What is the difference between, not just the difference between what is wrong and what is right, we'll learn what is the difference between what is wrong and what is, or what is right and what is almost right. Because that's the subtlety of all this, okay? So 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. For he, if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, 
I mean, a Jesus that is just all love and just wants to hug you and stuff, that's what people believe today, that he doesn't, he, that he doesn't care about sin anymore. He does care about sin. There's, no, there's no, not another Jesus. There's only one true Jesus. So if he cometh, preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, well, there's only one Holy Spirit, isn't there? So that other spirit would have to be a spirit of Satan or demonism, wouldn't it? Uh, right? I mean, that's just common sense. Okay, which ye have not received, or another gospel. So the implication is there's two gospels. There's the true gospel, there's the false gospel. There's not an almost gospel. I mean, this true gospel is the truth. The false gospel is false. There's only one that way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. They both can't be correct, can they? Only one is correct, and that's what Jesus did for you. Then he, Paul shows some sarcasm here. He says, which ye have not accepted, that you might well bear with him. So Paul is kind of saying, you guys put up with these guys. You really shouldn't put up with them. You know, these guys are coming in there teaching you false, false teachings. Okay, let's look at Colossians 2.8, another verse. This says, beware. Now, what does beware mean? It means to show some discernment, have some perception of what is right and wrong. Consider, carefully examine. It means, hey, don't just take everything that somebody says as true. Look it for your, yourself and try to understand, is what is being taught truth or not truth? You, we all have that responsibility. Don't just listen to somebody or watch some preacher on TV and, oh, everything he's saying is true because he looks good and he smiles and this and that. I mean, be very careful. We want to know truth and we want to make sure that it lines up with what the Bible says. So he says, beware lest any man spoil you. Spoil you means to captivate you, to lead you away from the truth. In other words, I can provoke, give you some happiness right now. So beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy from man. Philosophy is man's wisdom. Don't be fooled by it. Don't be fooled by vain deceit or self or empty deceit. That all comes from Satan. It's deception. After the tradition of men or after the teaching of men. Remember the song Elvis Presley sang? I did it my way. And that's what the world wants today. They want to do it their own way and not the way that Christ says. So then it says, after the rudiments of the world. Now, do we use that word anymore? Rudiments? Okay. That's an old King James word. But it means, you know, the psychology, the knowledge of the world that's being taught to you, all the things that, hey, we have something better for you, better than this Bible right here. Listen to us. And so, and it says, and not after Christ. You want to be safe? You want to be secure? Know your Bible. Understand your Bible. The Bible is the answer. There's no other Jesus there's no other gospel. There's no other spirit. So the world's philosophies, the world's traditions, the rudiments of the world will not make you happy. And if anything gives you temporary short time of happiness, it's fleeting and it goes away. If you want to have eternal value in your life, get to know your Bible and the things of Christ because that's what's going to last forever. Okay, now the New Age has their own book and that's what we're going to talk about next. And there's many books, but I'm just looking to look at this one book right now. And this one book here is called Jesus Calling, as you have a copy of a pamphlet in your bulletin. And this is written by Sarah Young. And this is like one of the number one popular books in Christianity. They've got it for kids. They've got it for businessmen. They've written this book over and over again. This book has gone through a bunch of uh, changes. And what I mean by changes, they kind of, it, original copy really looked like a New Age book. And it had so many quotes and things in there. They removed all them to try to make it look like it's not a New Age book. But it's been gone through some um, edit, editing and changed it quite a bit because people were starting to see through it. And so it was a very popular book. It's, it appeals to your flesh. It's a self-help, more of a self-help book. I'm not saying everything bad in this book. Everything in this book is bad. But there's enough bad in there that's enough to deceive you or trick you. So Sarah Young, the writer of this book, she was inspired to receive messages, what is called channeling. And I'll talk about that in just a minute after she read a book called God Calling. Now this book, God Calling, was written in like 1930 by a couple uh, women in England, and it was a devotional book, but they said they got all their information from a spirit that gave it to them and channeled into them, and they wrote this book. Well, to me, I would be very careful about that kind of stuff, wouldn't you? I, I just think you have to be careful when you're thinking that God is speaking to you personally and giving you all this information, especially when you have God's Word right here, the Bible. So, what is channeling? Well, channeling is a form of occult mediumship. They also call this centering prayer, okay? Have you ever heard of centering prayer? It opens your mind to receive spiritual messages. So, basically, you make your mind go blank, and you just sit there in quietness, and we'll get into this here in just a second. 
when we talk about uh, um, the prayer, but she also uses what's called visualization and guided imagery. Now, what is visualization? You sit there, I want a brand new red Mustang. I want a brand new red Mustang. God's going to give me a brand new red Mustang. And you keep thinking that, and you think it, and you're going to achieve it. Well, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But that's really what it's, what it's teaching you, that you think it, you can have it. Name it and claim it, they call it. What is guided imagery? Well, guided imagery is yesterday when it was real windy and cold, you set out in your patio on your deck, and you're sitting in a chair, you put your short sleeve shirt on, you have your shorts on, you're mad, and you're sitting in a beach in Aruba. And you hear the waves, you smell the sand, it's warm, the sunshine, the nice warm breeze. You see the birds in the, flying through and you hear the different, no, different things of your senses. And so that's what's called guided imagery. In other words, you, you make it up in your mind that this is the way it is. And so that's all part of the new age. Now there's a lot of terms, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but just so you get an idea that when you're reading something, you hear this, you realize what these terms are, new age terms. Co-create. Now in a different context, these terms have, can have different meanings to them, I understand that. But in a New Age context, this co-create means, hey, we all have this unity, we get together, we can create things with our own mind. And then the divine alchemy, what is alchemy? Alchemy was an old chemistry term back where they were trying to change metals into gold, okay? And then it became kind of a philosophy. But divine alchemy is like a divine secret that came down through um, Adam and Islam and all these sages and prophets and so on. And it's the idea that you can have contentment and harmony by following these seven stages of enlightenment, okay? That's what divine alchemy is. So if you see that term, you'll kind of have an idea. Uh, this may be something to do with the New Age. Love light is basically the energy of the New Age. Light barrier is a bearer, is somebody that promotes this stuff or preaches it. A supernatural plane is, you know, hey, if you're in a New Age, you can be up here, and you can look at everybody else. Well, you're just not as spiritual as I am. I'm up here. I've reached this plane. And that's what it means by a supernatural plane. Paradigm shift means you're starting to see things differently as the New Age teaches. Uh, true self. Now, you've all heard of a guy named Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra is a New Age guru, and he teaches a lot of this. He's written a lot of books, but it's all about peace and love. Then there's the ultimate reality, and the ultimate reality is that we have gods within ourselves. We can be like God. And... There's a lot of them that teach this stuff, even in churches, believe it or not. Then there's a universal reality. God is in everything. That's called pantheism, right? I mean, God is everywhere, but he's not in everything. You know that? Okay. So they also talk about things, and this is what is interesting. When you study the New Age, there are some of them that are receiving messages, and they're writing books or pamphlets or whatever, and they say that there's those that are out there that are against us and that are basically troublemakers. They have to be removed. And so they come up with this idea about... Well, this um, divine source that's given us information says we're going to remove all these bad people so that we can all unite. What do we call that in the Bible? We call that the rapture. So Satan's preparing an answer for the rapture through this New Age group that people are going to remove, be removed by UFOs or some way. And then everybody can get together and we can give peace a chance. That's all we are saying. You know, remember that old song. And, it'll, and people talk about that, hey, there's going to be a revival. Well, there may be a revival right after the rapture because people, just like 9-11, they finally started getting together and going to church for a short time. But after the rapture, it's going to shake people up. And, but the problem is Satan's going to deceive people. And that's, that's what's scary and sad about this. Okay, they also have this idea from the Eastern religions. You've all heard of it before, karma. Well, they don't call it karma in uh, Christianity. It's just saying if you do good, good things will happen to you. If you do bad, bad things will happen to you. Well, sometimes that tr is true, right? But many times it isn't. Many times, because we live in this world, which is an accursed world, and getting worse and worse, you do good things and think bad things happen to you. You know, And that's bad things happen to Jesus and the disciples, right? And down through the ages of Christianity, anybody that stood for Christ. Okay, let's keep moving along here. They have a dream, and that dream is of world peace and a false revival of uniting mankind. As you see that back in 1916, there was a magazine, New Age magazine, that talked about this. And, you know, we won't read Daniel 8, 24 through 25, but that is all about what Satan is saying, how he's going to come in this world, and he's going to deceive everybody with a false peace, and he's going to take over to be the leader of this world. And some of these people here, and I hope this doesn't offend you, but a lot of these guys that teach this, I'm not saying they're bad people. Some of these are very nice people, and they do a lot of nice things. But what they're teaching is wrong, such as Oprah Winfrey, Wayne Dyer, 
even Joel Osteen, okay? Rick Warren even has his foot in some of this, even though he's Southern Baptist. He's, now, he's retired now, but there's some things that he said that are very questionable. And then Robert Schuller back going back, had a lot to do with this. And as we get into what's called the Word of Faith, we'll see this here shortly. But Je Jeremiah 23, 32 says, be careful about having false dreams, okay? Because you have a dream and you think you can make it a reality. God has a plan how he's making this world. And if we think that we can change things in this world just by having a dream, we're wrong. We have to get in line with what God wants and what God teaches. Okay, so there's another term that you'll hear a lot in the New Age, and that's the term I am. Have you ever heard the term I am before? Remember Moses back in uh, when he was getting out of uh, Egypt, and he said the I am sent me, referring to God? Well, the New Age, they, they use that term I am all the time. And they're referring to you, that you are I am, and that you have this little God within you. So, so be wary of that, okay? They have this idea that self-discovery, uh, reawakening, and enlightenment, and so on and so on. So New Age books like this, even though they may seem uh, not harmful, and people get a lot of good out of these, they believe, be careful because these books are teaching a lot of things that aren't scriptural in the Bible. Okay, so just, just be conscious of that and understand that. If you don't believe me, search it yourself and really dig into it. If you want more information, I'll get you more information on this. But not only does the New Age have their books, they also have their own certain type of prayer. Isn't that interesting? So let's talk about prayer next. And they call it con contemplative prayer. Now what does contemplative actually mean? It means meditation. Is there anything wrong with meditation? No, we all meditate at times. But their idea of contemplative prayer is to open your mind, not think of anything, make your mind go blank so that you can receive messages from God. Well, we already have God's Word. Why don't we just go ahead and read verses and talk to God like they do in the Bible in the way we should be. Don't make your mind blank. Their, their favorite verse for this is Psalms 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. You ever heard this verse before, right? You know what they say that this verse means? It means make your mind quiet, silent, clear your mind of everything, empty your mind so it can be open to receive anything and just be silent. They, they'd say that's what that verse means. But you know what? That is not what that verse means. Look at the rest of the verse. The rest of the verse says, I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. It's all talking about us being anxiety, being worried, going through all these things in the world. And God says, hey, don't worry. Don't be filled with anxiety. I've got everything under control. That's what that verse really means. Have confidence that we may be going through a lot of awful things in our lives, or this world may be going through a lot of things, but you know what? God has it all under control. And that's really what that verse means. So when somebody takes a verse and divides it in half and says it means this or that, or takes it out of context, always go back and look at the verses before and after to try to understand, are they really teaching that verse for what it says? They also call this here um, centering prayer, which is a form of mysticism. Now what is mysticism? Mysticism is a belief in a direct experience or trans, transcendent reality. Transcendent reality means something above, something better, something supreme, or God, especially by means of contemplation, contemplation, which is meditation, or asceticism, which is self-denial, instead of rational thought. In other words, the idea is, hey, we'll go through this, we'll set and we'll just think about nothing, let our minds be blank, and let's just be open to God to speak to us. Well, it doesn't, that's not the prayer in the Bible. The prayer in the Bible is you speaking to God. You talking to God. And he answers you through his word in many different ways. But it's not to open your mind up and allow yourself to be filled with the stuff. You're opening up your mind to some bad things sometimes doing this. So be careful about that. Uh, there was a guy that has studied this for years, 20-some years or 30 years, Ray Youngin. And he's passed away now. He's passed away like in 2015. But here's what he said. The hallmark of contemplative prayer is found in such phrases as waiting for God in silence, stilling your thoughts, seeking God's presence in the silence, advancing in inward stillness, all with the characteristic of stopping normal flow of thought. So the idea is just make your mind blank and let it be open to whatever can come into your mind. And you know what? A lot of people, when they get on drugs or alcohol, they open up their mind to evil evil, demonism, and so on and so on. But that's the idea here. Don't think about anything. Just let your mind be open and let whatever wants to come into your mind come into your mind. But, you know, the Bible doesn't teach that. So the idea here is open your mind by emptying your mind and by thinking of nothing or repeating a phrase 
our word over and over again. Now Matthew 6, 7 says, let me read that verse to you, if I've got it here. Matthew 6, 7 says, Jesus said, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Okay, just make the same thing over and over and over again. Now we do pray for a lot of the same things, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But this is talking about during your prayer, just saying the same things over and over and over and over again, like there's some kind of power in that. So, that's the idea of the New Age contemplative prayer. Now, it is important to note here that the purpose of contemplative prayer is to enter an altered state of consciousness in order to find one true self, that's finding God. Well, doesn't the Bible kind of point out the way we are? We find our true self with what the Bible says, right? I don't think I need to sit in a corner and hum or say some words over and over again to find the way I am. I know how I am. God's Word tells me how I am. So be very careful about this. Okay, so there's a book that the New Age has, many books. There's a, a prayer that they have. They actually have an exercise too. Now you're going to say, you have gone too far. You're attacking my exercise. Well, let's look at this real quick and see. It is called yoga. Okay, what is wrong with yoga? It's just exercise. Well, let's look at this, and I'm just saying be careful. I mean, I know many of you have done yoga, and I've done it in the past too. You know, and, but just let's, let's learn about this and understand this. Okay. Um, back when I was a kid going to school, we had calisthenics, gym class. We had what was called dynamic stretching or static stretching and all this. But today, you go to churches, the YMCA, exercise places, they all have yoga. It's kind of taken over America, hasn't it? It's like the main thing today. So in the U.S., Yoga is a type of exercise in which you move your body into various positions in order to become more fit or flexible, to improve your breathing, and to relax your mind, right? I mean, that's what we look at as uh, yoga here in the U.S. But there's more to this than that. And I'm not saying exercise is anything wrong with it, and I'm not saying going through this is necessarily anything wrong with it, but you have to understand the underlying meaning behind all this. So here, here's what the Hinduism meaning comes from, means where it came from. Hindus believe that yoga is an important practice that helps them to be close to Brahman. Now, Brahman is their cosmic force of existence. It's not a god. It's some kind of cosmic force. The idea is that through yoga, Hindus can reach God either as a personal god or as the god within humans. So Hinduism has yoga for a purpose. It's a religious purpose. In fact, look at this. The person that leads yoga over in the countries that, where Hinduism is is called a yogi, okay? That's the leader, or a swami, or a pandit. And the yo word actually means yoke. The word yoga, actually, yogi, means yoke. You're connecting yourself with, with one of the gods of the Hindus. And that ought to scare you a little bit, right? Now, I know when people exercise, they're not sitting there thinking of this stuff, and I understand that. It's just, it's just for you and many others, it's just exercise. But I'm just saying to be careful about it, because it's a stepping stone to something else. So just always be careful with that. I believe it's got a religious significance behind it. And so here, here's what a guy from, that knows about yoga, he says this, yoga has a spiritual nature that is psychic and metaphysical. This is one reason why experts such as Professor Subhas Tawari of the Hindu University of America says, yoga is Hinduism. I've read some quotes and I've listened to some uh, YouTubes and, and DVDs that talk about this. And the people over in India and these other countries that practice Hinduism, they look at us and say, and say, what? These people are doing yoga? Don't they realize that they're practicing the Hindu religion? And they kind of question it as us just looking at it as exercise. So, yoga is the missionary arm for New Age spirituality. Yoga says to empty your mind. Now, I know when you go to exercise at the YMCA, they may not be telling you to empty your mind or anything. I don't know. Maybe some places do or not. I don't know. But isn't that interesting? That, that sounds similar to uh, the New Age books and also the contemplative prayer, Empty Your Mind. Don't, don't you see how these are all fit together? Because that's what yoga tells you. So here's the thing. Yoga poses are offerings to like 330 million Hindu gods, says Dr. George Alexander. I never knew there was that many gods, yoga gods. Isn't that crazy? I only know one true God. That's Jehovah, the God of the Bible. So look at these poses here real quick. In Hinduism, all these poses have religious or spiritual meaning or significance to them. Now, I'm not saying that you're worshiping the devil if you did yoga before. I'm not saying that at all. 
I'm just saying be conscious of this and be aware of this. Okay, so the first one upper left. That pose means Lord of the Fish, okay? All of them have some kind of religious meaning to them. The one in top center is the eight bends. Now, I'm not, it's Vedic, Sage. I, I don't know how to pronounce all these words, okay? But it's the eight bends. Then this one to the right is to their monkey god, okay? Then to the lower left is uh, Vashishta, their Hindu god. And the one in the center is Dita Shiva, which means God, the dance of the universe. And this one here to the right is a warrior pose. So there's many different, these poses all have some meaning to them in the Hindu religion. And we practice them for exercise, and there's nothing wrong with exercise. Just be aware that this has a religious meaning to it when you're doing it, okay? And research this yourself. I'm saying be careful, be very careful. So... There, we talked about that there's a book, there's a prayer, there's an exercise. There's also a system of theology in Christianity. And we'll be done here very shortly. And it's called the Word of Faith. So, is the Word of Faith, is it really faith? Now, it has many different names to this, multiple types in, in churches, in different ways it's, it's in there. But if you want to talk about money, the Word of Faith talks about money. Money, 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 uh, power worship, and so on, and not the worship that we could think of. It's also called the Word of Faith Movement. And it was started by a guy named E.W. Kenyon, and it's about positive confessions and new thought. It was popularized by a guy named Ken Hagen, which you've probably heard of. He's kind of the father of all this. Today, many of these people are the ones that teach us in some form or manner. I'm not saying 100% all of these guys, but the truth is, Joel Olstein teaches a lot of this positive thinking about, you know, if you think it, you can have it. Um, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, T.G. T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, Creeflo Dollar, even Andrew Womack. If you research their theology, you find out that they're teaching some of this word of faith movement that, hey, if you claim, name it, you can claim it. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. Uh, there's even Joyce Meyer. Did I just say that? Yes, yeah, she teaches this stuff too. Paul Crouch, Oral Roberts did. Uh, back when, remember Jim Baker, Jim Swaggart, the Charismatics, they taught this stuff too. And I'll give you one more. This a Southern Baptist Church, the largest Southern Baptist Church in America was Rick Warren. Now, Rick Warren is retired, but he taught a lot of this stuff, too. He really did, if you research what he taught. And I'm, I'm not saying that to get you all shook up. I'm saying search this yourself. So, it's based on the teaching that God promises health, wealth, material desires, all your dreams by practicing their faith-related formulas and theology. And if you don't get it, if you're poor, it's because you don't have enough faith. If you're sick, it's because you have, don't have enough faith. Never say to yourself something negative that, hey, I'm sick. Always say that I'm healthy because you're causing a negative force if you say you're sick. And if you say you're poor, you're causing a negative force. You always say, I'm, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy, I'm wealthy. You're That's the idea behind the new age. And it has crept into the church. And word of faith is probably the largest one, along with Charismatics, Pentecostals, and many other churches too. Okay? But let me look, let's look at the five points of this word of faith. First, they say faith is a force controlled by your words and amount of faith. Um, if you want something, you can have it. Um, always be positive about stuff. Always let it, you know, claim it and name it is what they say. So, what it really is faith? Is faith a force? No, faith is not a force. A faith is being convinced something is true, isn't it? It's, it's basically faith is the idea that I believe this, that it's true. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.12, I think Paul gives the best definition there when he says he believed and he was persuaded that it was true. That's 2 Timothy 1.12. He believed, he was persuaded. So faith is a persuasion that something is true. I have faith in Christ. I have faith that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for my sins and I have trusted him. I believe in him. That's faith. Faith is not some kind of magic force like, mm, I can make something happen. It's not a force. So just understand that. And that's what they teach. And they have this idea of prosperity gospel or the health wealth gospel. And they say, if you're not rich, if you're not healthy, then you don't have enough faith. That's what these guys teach. Now, who's the ones that get wealthy? They do. But isn't it interesting these same guys also get sick and they also die? So, yet, the, here's what's very sad about this. The people that are involved in these movements um, keep sending their money in and keep doing this. And they basically, they empty their bank accounts, hoping that there's some truth to this. And the sad thing is... They go poor. If these guys get rich, they drive, fly around in their jet planes or their fancy cars and so on and have their big mansions, and yet people stay and keep giving to it 
even though they see that this doesn't work, they just keep telling you don't have enough faith, you don't have enough faith, you don't have enough faith. That's sad. It really is sad when you think about it because people get sucked into this. And then the third one is that men are little gods. They can control their reality and destiny. In other words, you have the power. You can do it. Just think it. And so then the fourth one is the seed faith teaching. That's giving money and God will give you back a multiple harvest. Now I can tell you, if you give money to Big New Bible Church, I cannot promise you that you're going to get money back. I believe you'll be blessed because you're obedient to God, okay? But that's different. I believe when we do things for God in this world, we get our blessings more in heaven. Doesn't it say in Matthew, I can't remember the verse, act 5 or 6 chapter, that um, send your treasures to heaven, not on earth where the rust does, they rust and they deteriorate and so on, right? We should get our rewards in heaven. Okay, the last one here is name it and claim it. The power of your words can claim a job, house, or car. In other words, you just think it, you can claim it. But what does the Bible say about all this? So this is our last, last slide here, and we'll be done here in just a minute. And so that's 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. Now, if, you, if you're there in 2 Timothy, I'm going to look in verse 1, because verse 1 talks about the last days, perilous times will come. Does anybody think that we have perilous times right now? I think we do. And then in verse 2 it says that people will be lovers of their own selves. Verse 5 it says they will have a form of godliness but denying the power. Verse 12 in 2 Timothy chapter 3 says that if you live a godly life you will suffer persecution. And then verse 13 says there will be seducers that become worse and worse deceiving people. Right? That's what it says. He's leading up to verse 16. But verse 14 he says continue what you have learned. In other words, be confident what you have learned because you learned God's word. Then he goes on in verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, all scripture, meaning Old Testament, New Testament, is given by inspiration of God, which means it's God breathed, God controlled the way the words would be written on the pages, and is profitable or valuable for doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. We learn about God. We learn truth. Um, for reproof means admonish, admonishing, encourage, encouraging. All of us have some blindness, right? And we need to see. And we, get, we see by learning and understanding God's word. And it's for correction, getting us back on track. It's like we start drifting a little bit, and he gets us back on track. Then for instruction, and that guides you down that track straight. And that's why you need this instruction from the Bible. In righteousness, God wants us to live righteous lives. And so all that from verse 16, we go now to verse 17. Why? that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I believe that verse tells us that the Bible is sufficient. It says you can be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished. What else do you need? We need to wake up. God's word is all sufficient unto all good works. God's word has authority and it teaches us and if we obey God's word, we follow God's word, you will be blessed abundantly. So as a Christian, in ending, we need to train well, we need to run well, we need to finish well, because there's waiting for us a crown if we serve Christ all the way through our lives. But as a child of God, you need to grow to adulthood as a mature believer. Now, you know the Bible tells us that we're all sinners, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. In other words, if we die in our sins, we'll spend eternity in hell. You know what the New Age teaches? The New Age teaches that sin is an illusion. Well, if it's an illusion, you go up and slug him in the nose, well, it's just an illusion. You know, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't hurt you. Take their wallet. I didn't do anything wrong. Sin's just an illusion. Well, it's a, an illusion until it affects them, right? Okay. And then they say that the Savior is you. You save yourself. When I believe that we have sin, we'll die in our sins unless we, Christ, we believe that he paid for our sins. So our Savior is Jesus Christ. Faith to a new age person is to have faith in yourself. Faith in the Bible is to have faith in Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross for our sins. It's that simple. It's easy. Let me just explain to you this real quick, and then we'll be done. I just want to show this to you, just so make sure that everybody here understands this. Let this hand represent you and I. Okay? Let this wallet represent sin. We're all sinners, right? Anybody believe that we're not sinners? We all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. And yet, let this hand represent God the Father sent in His Son, Jesus Christ. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, to die on the cross for our sins. And He took our place. So Jesus Christ took our place, died on the cross for our sins, and if you just simply believe in that, He gives you eternal life. That's the gift. It's the gift of God. 
Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 says, for by, it says, uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The verses behind me, John 3, 16. If you believe them verses for what they say, you know, you'll have eternal life and go to heaven because Christ paid for your sins on the cross of Calvary. How many sins did he pay for? He paid for all of them. And he rose again showing the payment was done. And if you trust him, he gives you eternal life. It's that simple. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Then we'll have our final song, which will be a Christmas song. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we could get together today and learn your word and study your word. And even though this was a different type of a topic today, as we studied the New Age, next week we'll be talking about discernment. And pray for us that as we get into this Christmas season that we always think of others and that we realize that Jesus Christ, you are coming back for us someday and it may not be that far off. And just pray that, Lord, we're ready and we're serving you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our final song is going to be, Oh, Come All Ye Faithful, then we'll be dismissed. If anybody wants to have anything from the breakfast bar, please feel free.